Bonjour, mon nom est Diamond. Je suis journaliste indépendante à Montréal. Mes pronoms, c'est elle et she, her. Et bienvenue au BIPOC Hour. Hi, my name is Kevin Asen. I am an educator PhD student and I use he, him pronouns. And welcome to the BIPOC Hour. Yeah, uh, so Kevin, tell me what coming in and coming out means for you. Start off with a loaded question. Yeah, um, loaded questions. <laughs> coming in, coming out. I think what's important to think about here is how when we think about pride, we often think about this necessity to be out and to be um, constantly performing this kind of queer aesthetic. And I think what's important to think about also is that these notions of queerness and queer performance is not necessarily something that um, needs to be on public display. Mm. Um, I think for a lot of us, um, and I think I'm speaking you know, from the framework of queer Asians, but I think mm. also for a lot of other um, non-Western folks and non-Western mm -hmm. queer folks, um, the notion of coming in or what we would say not coming out mm -hmm. or being selective with coming out and whatever that means, and I think we will, we'll start talking about that in a bit, um, is one that focuses more on um, our relations with ourselves as queer mm -hmm. folks, right? And I think um, one that contests this kind of colonial knowledge and colonial um, ways of being queer in settler colonial society. So that was a loaded, uh, question, but I'd love to hear what you think about that. Yeah, I think I think that's the thing. I do think that in Asian cultures, there is just a tendency to be a lot more muted mm -hmm. about things, which includes queerness. Because I do think that for a lot of queer Asians, like we can still be fully queer and fully enjoy our lives as queer people without mm -hmm. announcing it to the world. Right. And like, I think that often a lot of notions around community and relationships with others and how our queerness will reflect on the community around us are also things that we take into consideration. Because I think that being queer and being Asian, it's so embedded in all the relationships that we have with our community that it's just not possible to just make it as just like a very big individualistic statement. Like, mm -hmm. do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Just to kind of piggyback on what you're saying about yeah. this individ individualism, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of, um, in terms of this idea of being out for whom, mm -hmm. and um, and for what purpose, right? Mm -hmm. um, is it is it one way to to, to is it a, is it a way to survive in in, in queer society or whatever mm -hmm. that means? Um, or is it one that really contends with um, um, desires that are not, you know, your own? Mm -hmm. So I, I want to kind of also challenge the notion of like the closet, right? Mm -hmm. Where, wherever that came from um, and what that closet means for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, what's interesting about the closet is that... Um, people have different meanings and different definitions as to what's outside of that closet. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when we think about the closet, um, and I'll use air quotes here just because I'm not really satisfied with the term closet, yeah. but I want to think about how um, inside the closet can be a safe haven for many of us. Yeah. Um, and it's also one that is generative yeah. in our own queer uh, relations and also queer um, identity formation. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm also like trying to not be academic here, but also kind of referring to the notion of staying in mm -hmm. by um, a great scholar named uh, Summer Lee Kim, um, who talks about staying in as a way to be anti-colonial, mm. right? Is one way of not um, uh, engaging with some of the um, aesthetics of queerness mm -hmm. or aesthetics of, of Western ways of being. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about asociality as a way of um, taking care of oneself yeah. um, and to protect oneself from the harms that are out there. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, I think like we queer Asians don't live in a vacuum. Like we still live in a world where there is like racism, sexism, oh, yeah. homophobia. And I mean, if the safest options for a lot of us 
is to stay in the closet or to stay partially in the closet to avoid being hurt or avoid hurting others in our community. And that's mm. how we can thrive and that's how we can live our fullest lives. That I really do think that that's a totally valid option mm. too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, that doesn't mean that you're ashamed of being queer or like you don't want to show it to other people, but it's more like I respect myself and I respect others around me and I want a safe and happy life for myself and for the people I love around me. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And it's and it's also to kind of debunk the idea that we're not missing out on anything. Yeah. Right? It's not that because we selectively um, come out to certain folks and not come out to others doesn't mean that we're missing out on on our own queer identities or queer relations. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think I want to kind of expand on what you were saying Mm -hmm. earlier in terms of like protecting others. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes that is, you know, for us at least, I would say, is defined through relations with our community, Mm -hmm. relations with our, um, um, you know, people that we care about, but also Mm -hmm. people that we don't know. Yeah. Right? And I I think what's really interesting around that is... um, as people who are more, um, I would say, community-oriented yeah. or kind of through the collectivist lens, is to think about um, who are we taking care of and mm-hmm. how are we taking care of them. Mm-hmm. And um, the decision um, or the act of coming in or not coming out uh, or coming out is also one that speaks to those relations and mm-hmm. how that may affect them too. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say that we are holding back um, because of these people. Mm -hmm. Rather, um, we do it out of a labor of love and care uh, through an ethic of care and love as well. Yeah, absolutely. That kind of reminds me of this woman I interviewed for an article about a month ago. So uh, in, in the article, like... I call her Tam. It's not her real name, but uh, she identifies as like sexual and aromantic. And Mm -hmm. that's kind of like the arc of her coming in, coming out stories where Mm -hmm. she just selectively came out to people. And she told me that one of the reasons she doesn't want to come out to everyone is to protect her family Mm -hmm. because she's very aware that like her immigrant Vietnamese family like, they've been in Montreal for decades, but, like, they're, they still really struggle to fit in into, mm-hmm. like, the more mainstream Montreal-wide society. And she doesn't want her parents to become alienated from their Vietnamese community mm-hmm. by her being, like, very out and very right. open with her sexuality. So... I think that, like, for her, like, not coming out to everyone is really a way to protect herself, but also to protect her family. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, like, she told me that even if her family just currently accepts her Mm -hmm. as she is and accepts her sexual identity, that it's just, like, how they function, that they Mm -hmm. just, like, prefer to be, like, more discreet. And I think, like, the the fact that also she's a romantic and asexual like, I just feel like these are sexualities in the queer community that we just yeah. don't talk about a yeah. lot. I just feel like every time there's, like, queer anything, like, the things that are at the forefront are very, yeah. like, very hypersexual, very, like, flamboyant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's, like, and all about that. sexuality. And, and that's that. great. Love that. But love there's it. also, <laughs> like, kind of other ways mm-hmm. of expressing queer sexualities as well. You Absolutely. know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think just to kind of add on to what you were saying about mm-hmm. Tam's experience is I think for, for our audiences to think about um, mm-hmm. how that, how those decisions stem and come from love rather yeah. than fear. Yeah. So I think a lot of people oftentimes associate fear with these decisions and yeah. these choices. Um, but rather, I think we would like to invite people to think about how that comes from a place of love and mm-hmm. care. Um, uh, for others, right? And mm-hmm. I think um, that kind of segues into our next one, loving yeah. others and uh, loving ourselves. Um, 
which is one of the uh, titles or categories, I should say, for yeah. our Sticky Rice Volume 2. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, can you speak a little bit about that so that we could potentially you know, elaborate a little bit more on the heavier side? Yeah, um, I do think that that's like very interesting because, like I said, like queer Asians sexualities and gender identity is so tied mm -hmm. into like a relationship with the community that that is often through the lens of which like these gets expressed so to mm -hmm. come back for example to tam's story even though she didn't come out to everyone like i found it very interesting about how she used like her unique position mm -hmm. in like the asian queer community as like being both asexual and aromantic mm -hmm. and she has been advocating for her other queer Asian friends who are not asexual and mm -hmm. not aromantic and have other queer sexualities and gender identity and trying to like communicate with their families and mm -hmm. with their parents and to establish like a dialogue of like what it means to be queer and what mm -hmm. that is and trying to kind of educate them. And she told me that she's in a very good position to do that. Be that be is like because of her sexuality, yeah. like she doesn't have a partner to hide. Mm. You know, she like mm. anything that she does would not reflect badly on her family mm -hmm. because she just doesn't have anything to hide. Right. So I think like that's a very interesting way to build community and bridge, you know, a lot of the gaps between um the older generation and the younger generation and queer asians right. and straight asians you right know? right right yeah there's a lot of unmaking right, yeah that needs to happen um what's interesting when we think about loving others or loving yourself mm -hmm. is again to step away from the framework of individualism yeah. right and how even in the notion of loving yourself mm -hmm. is not rooted in the individual but mm -hmm. rather um, through relations and I yeah. think a lot about kinship and kin making mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot about different types of solidarity movements that uh, mm -hmm. and social movements that kind of allow those relational bridges to happen mm -hmm. right allowing those um, relations for love to happen and so I'm also thinking about how what you were saying in terms of um, educating other yeah. folks right and um, not necessarily always needing to be at the forefront of educating people, but mm -hmm. also kind of living as an example, yeah. right? And so kind of like Tam's example with asexuality and aromanticism is to think about how um, this is how I live mm -hmm. and like take it or leave it, right? Mm -hmm. I got nothing to lose. Um, and it's also for our kind of queer kin to, whether Asian or not, to kind of situate themselves in relation to that and understand, mm -hmm. well, what does queerness mean, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think we're sitting here with a, a very um, unsatisfied definition of queerness, right? And yeah. I think, um, I, think I, I kinda like that. I kinda mm -hmm. like that yeah. because that allows us to really mm -hmm. kind of keep moving forward and thinking about um, how queerness or, or, um, or again to piggyback on other scholars, but like Jose Esteban Munoz talks about like cruising utopia, like queerness mm -hmm. as utopia, as, as not a place, but something that we'll never really get to. Yeah. But it's, that never allows us to think about the possibilities that mm -hmm. arise from it. So in our current movement of coming to know what that means for any of us is to sit with the discomfort and mm -hmm. stick with the uncertainties of queerness or um, the, the, you know, very you know dissatisfying um, or unsatisfying i don't even know which one is the right word uh, definitions of queerness to kind of live um as a counter story to all of that right yeah um so yeah i don't want to take you know take too much time on 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 on, on that particular aspect of it but i, I do want to talk more about loving others mm -hmm. um so what are your thoughts about kind of like, who are the others for you? Yeah, I mean, I think, like, how when I see others is anyone who has some kind of relationship or connection with mm -hmm. queer Asians. So it could be, like, our family or friends or social circles or, like, 
or colleagues right. or just like people in society that we interact with that maybe like we don't necessarily have a very close relationship with like the store clerk or like just mm -hmm. like people like that but just people we've come into contact with and i mm -hmm. think that that's how i would define others and i would say that different types of relationships will influence mm -hmm. how we express or queerness or whether we choose yeah. to express it and i think that it's very reflected in for example a lot of chinese languages where I know that, for example, in Mandarin, like people differentiate between like paternal grandmother, maternal mm -hmm. grandmother, paternal, mm -hmm. like older aunts or paternal mm -hmm. younger aunts. So like there's like all of these little nuances mm -hmm. are very important. And I think that also just like reflects into how we relate to others and how we yes. relate to the world and it will change. Mm -hmm. So I think just seeing an ex like or expression of queerness as like we will be like that for everyone and that's how we're going to express ourselves for everyone is yeah. is not really the case for queer Asians mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. I like what you said about the choice of yeah. expressing it right yeah how it's not for everyone to see and it's not for everyone to no. know and to, to 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 relate to it's <laughs> my it's my business right yeah. it's, it's uh it's for me and for the people that I love only um, or that I, I, I want to care about, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then kind of extending on the notion of others being those who are potentially those who are, we, know, we don't have relations with, but who are relational in other aspects right, yeah. of life and society. Um, like you were saying in terms of like, um, you know, clerks and, and people that you encounter on a daily. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do want to kind of like highlight, you know, in terms of thinking about my relations with students that yeah. um, I might not necessarily have a, personal relationship other out, other than that of the classroom mm -hmm. but to think about how um, even through the mode of education mm -hmm. um, to kind of allow for different conversations to happen mm -hmm. and to to generate from those spaces mm -hmm. and I think what's important is um, that it happens organically yeah. rather than like maybe intention is not the right word but with full-on full-on mm -hmm. intention, right? Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people tend to think about how we need to educate folks and therefore we need to be all up in your face about mm -hmm. all of this, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that was also kind of the backlash with um, the, uh, the surplus amount of pain stories around anti-Asian racism mm -hmm. in the last couple of months and year to think about how um, we could dwell in that pain story and mm -hmm. dwell in the hurts of anti-Asian racism, but like, where do we go from that, right? Yeah, yeah. And what's the point of constantly talking about pain stories when we're not allowing, or in that conversation that people are um, instigating, are not allowing for um, a generative outcome or a generative new beginning mm -hmm. um, of something that is more healing yeah right? um, and that could be whether it could be either with other people or with ourselves or with our own folks mm -hmm. but um, I think similarly to the conversation around queerness or expressions of queerness as as our own um, something that we have that we possess mm -hmm. uh, is so precious and sacred that it's not necessarily um, a must to constantly be flaunting mm -hmm. that for others um, that ultimately that act doesn't benefit us right yeah um, so that's my point of view I'm sure a lot of people would disagree <laughs> but hey I'm here to be controversial which is fine by me yeah um, but I, yeah I kind of liked what you said about like healing mm -hmm. and just like finding a way forward because that reminds me of uh, an article that I made for the second edition of Sticky Race for mm -hmm. the Asiatic Queer. So there was one of the collaborators, Soraya, who wrote a letter to her mother because the relationship she had with her mother was very stressed. So in her letter, when she talks about, for example, how her uh, adolescence was difficult, euh, parce qu'il y avait des problèmes à la maison mm -hmm. et que c'est aussi durant son adolescence qu'elle a eu sa première relation queer. Mm -hmm. Et que 
comme dans beaucoup de familles asiatiques, comme c'était pas mal comme un nom dit Comme la mère, elle n'a pas vraiment fait de commentaire dessus. Elle a comme juste accepté, puis elle n'en a pas vraiment parlé. Euh, donc, euh, dans le fond, et comme la, la dernière section de son texte parle de comment elle a réussi durant sa vie adulte à renouer avec mmh. sa mère mmh. et comme de renouer avec euh, des racines cambodgiennes de sa mmh. mère en faisant des voyages dans, au Cambodge mmh. euh, et en essayant aussi euh, d'avoir euh, de la compassion pour sa mère aussi. Mmh. Donc, mmh. Euh, elle, elle a vraiment fait un beau texte où elle a écrit que même si la relation avec sa mère était conflictuelle, elle ne croyait pas à couper les ponts et à juste comme mmh. plus jamais voir sa mère, mais mmh. elle voulait vraiment avoir une approche de compassion et de dialogue. Right. Et je pense que ça, c'est vraiment une approche qu'on peut avoir pour l'avenir. Parce que si on reste toujours dans le conflit, ça serait toujours un cercle vicieux de conflit. Yeah. Mais si on voit qu'il y a une voie qu'on peut prendre pour essayer de guérir et essayer comme de renouer avec des choses qui ont peut-être été détruites euh, et d'essayer de reconstruire ça, je pense qu'on pourrait avoir un avenir. Come through. T'sais? Come through. Yeah, I love that. I mm -hmm. love that. I think what's, what's, um, what is to be taken away from that is also this idea of how generous queer love is, right? Mm. And how... Um, Although heavy, mm -hmm. although very difficult to struggle with, mm -hmm. um, that love is so central to all of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that it, de it demands and it requires compassion for yourself mm -hmm. um, in the making of being compassionate for others. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's beautiful in terms of thinking about using time um, to heal, but also to, to mend relations that mm -hmm. were once, you know, fractured or, or whatever mm -hmm. the word um, you want to use, to think about how those relations are also queer. Yeah. Right? Um, and how queer love manifests differently in those relations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I remember reading that piece and it was hard to read because mm -hmm. it was just so so personal and so, um, you know, so emotional mm -hmm. where I, you know, I, I can't relate fully, but I can relate in certain aspects of it, right? And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people can find themselves in that piece, mm -hmm. can situate uh, an experience throughout that piece. And so um, I'm so glad that you brought it up because what? <laughs> I would not be able to, You can get into that conversation because it's so, yeah. Je pense que juste le fait qu'elle a été capable d'écrire une lettre comme ça, mm -hmm. avec, euh, qui, qui est vraiment lourd et que ça, ça indique qu'elle a aussi eu le temps de faire beaucoup d'introspection yeah. et de travail sur elle-même et euh, de réflexion sur ça, ce qui est vraiment difficile à faire. Et ce n'est pas Ouh. tout le monde qui yeah. va faire ça non plus. Yeah, yeah. Um, et le fait que, comme elle a eu le courage ou le mm -hmm. désir de partager ça, comme je me rappelle, comme dans la, dans la première rencontre que j'ai eue avec elle, elle a dit que Diamond, moi, je veux écrire cette question-là, un, pour renouer avec euh, ma mère, mm -hmm. et deux, pour que les autres qui vivent des choses comme mm -hmm. ça ne se sentent pas aussi seuls. Donc, mm -hmm. ils peuvent se retrouver dans ça. Et ce que je trouve vraiment intéressant dans sa lettre, c'est qu'elle finit par réaliser que oui, elle, elle a été très blessée, mm -hmm. mais que sa mère aussi était très blessée. Mm -hmm. Et que c'est en se comprenant l'une et l'autre qu'elles peuvent comme, renouer la relation et yes. aller de l'avant ensemble. Yeah. Ouais. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> I'm going to pause on that. OK. <laughs> What's our next topic? Right. Queer representation. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. Queer representation. Let's talk about queer misrepresentation. Yeah. 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 You see, I was thinking the same right? thing, so we're on the same wavelength. Because I ain't about representation here. <laughs> We've got a lot. We've got a lot of misrepresentations out there that yeah. I do not take, I do not claim mm -hmm. one bit 
um, controversial, but mm -hmm. I want to hear what you what you think, and then I'll gather my thoughts. Okay, Take putting me in the hot seat. <laughs> um, down. So I think that because the queer community as a whole is just so diverse mm -hmm. and there's just so many voices and perspective and people with different backgrounds in it, there's bound to be a certain segment of the queer community that has a much bigger public platform mm -hmm. than other segments of the queer community. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that, as we have said before, queer Asians tend to be a bit more subtle with their queerness and mm -hmm. to not necessarily endorse an approach where we just show it to everyone and are very public about it. Mm -hmm queer Asians tend to get kind of lost into the conversation or mm. get misrepresented in the conversation be just because of how we express our queerness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that can lead to problems in representation just because queer Asian might not necessarily choose to put themselves out there in like a right. very public space and to just talk about their queerness. Yeah. You know, but I also think that on the other hand, because representation in the queer community has been by a certain group of people disproportionately for a long time, it can be difficult to get other perspective and other voices mm -hmm. in when it doesn't fit with like the perspective that has been there for a long time. So for right. example, if you have like, very loud queer voices that say that in order to be quote unquote a good queer you have to be very out there and very flamboyant and want to like be in the public space all the time and as like a queer Asians that's not what we want to do mm -hmm. then we're going to have a bit of a problem in accessing these public platforms mm -hmm. you know what mm -hmm. I mean and those problems and conflicts are true and real yeah um, listen <laughs> Let me gather my thoughts. Okay. Um, yes. So, um, in response to that, mm -hmm. I think I totally agree. Right? It's mm -hmm. this kind of, kind of going back to what you were saying earlier about the choice of expression, mm -hmm. so our queerness, right? And I don't want to call it aesthetics. I don't want to call it culture. I don't want to call it anything else but ness. Mm -hmm. um, is to think about how when we talk about representation. Um, or inclusion, mm -hmm. right, is to think about what are we being included into. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of us, I think, inherently we know that we don't want to be in those spaces mm -hmm. because those spaces serve zero good for any of us, mm -hmm. right? As you said earlier, not only are we navigating the oppressions of, you know, anti-queerness, but we're also navigating oppressions of racist, uh, racist um, oppressions or racism, um, mm -hmm. Um, to be clear, and even within those, uh, within the space, the queer spaces mm -hmm. that we know, um, there's a lot of other contentions, right? There's, yeah. You know, like in terms of um, struggles and uh, and and and, and um, tensions around people being. Uh, fatphobic, transphobic, yeah. racist, and all of these happen to tap onto a lot of us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think not only is it uh, a problem when it comes to just being Asian and queer, mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't want to engage in a conversation around intersectionality as an identity, but rather yeah. um, as convergence of mm -hmm. um, domination, mm -hmm. right? Um, that are, are experienced in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And so I want to think about how those structures of power then oppresses people. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about representation yeah. uh, within queer spaces, oftentimes what goes unheard of and, and pretty much swept under the rug is, is, is the dynamics around racial tensions, right? Um, and how that situates us in how queer one person is, or are they legitimately queer? Mm -hmm. um, and whether or not we, we, we and, and oftentimes that's just disguised, right? Yeah. Disguised in this idea of like, 
oh, you're not queer enough, therefore you're not allowed to be part of this space. Mm -hmm. But in reality, there's a lot of racial tensions that are embedded in that kind mm -hmm. of thinking and that kind of um, interaction and, and engagement, so, or the lack of engagement. Um, so when we talk about misrepresentation, I think also about how um, the very people that are out there, <laughs> yeah. and, and whether or not this is about queer Asians or just Asian representation, I think a lot of people out there are also prob like those that we know of um, that are taking up space in popular media, mm -hmm. that are taking up space um, in public spaces, mm -hmm. um, are those who, are, who have very um, opposing politics than many of us. Mm. And so that... Um, what that does is that it doesn't actually do anything in relation to elevating our um, our our um, liberation, but yeah. rather continuously oppressing, um, because it gives so many reasons for people to dislike X Y Z, which then reflects back onto us. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would love to hear what you think. Yeah, I mean, I kind of. I really do agree with a lot of what you said. And as someone who works in the media, I have seen that a lot. And I think a big part of a problem is how a lot of industries mm -hmm. that tend to like end up giving people a big public platform, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of like entertainment, mm -hmm. media, journalism, um, politics, like any kind of these very public industries right. is has is hard to access mm -hmm. for a lot of like racialized people or queer right. racialized people um there's just like a lot of barriers of access into these so the people who end up getting into these industries are people who tend to already have certain privileges mm -hmm. and they are not necessarily representative of just the community they come from because it's just the most privileged people from that community mm. who have access to these industries. So, like, I do think that a big part of the problem lies into making these industries a lot more accessible mm. to more people so that you don't mm. have, like, the gates are not as closed mm. and you have, like, a wider mm. variety of people in there because I do think that a lot of the discourse around representation is, like, great, we yeah. have an Asian person, we have like a queer person, mm -hmm. but they don't look at just like how maybe these Asian or queer people are people who have a lot of financial privilege, Ooh. which is... You went there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, which is exactly what it takes to... Crazy open, like, Rich Asians, not the movie. <laughs> not right? The movie. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, to like mm. access the media or access you know, newsroom or access like polit politics or mm -hmm. like TV or entertainment, a lot of times if you don't have some kind of money, mm -hmm. it's just very hard for you to get into it because these are also industries that traditionally are not known to pay very well. Mm -hmm. So the people who can make a career out of it and have like a viable career and support themselves mm -hmm. are people who already have financial privilege Oof. so yes. I, I think I think that definitely like financial privilege is an intersection that people don't like to think about or people often forget mm -hmm. but it's reflected in the queer Asian community just Ooh, like in yes. any other yes, communities yes, yes. as well absolutely yeah. and also not to forget to think about how in those spaces yeah what are we trying to actually achieve yeah right like are we trying to achieve representation in ways that actually help liberate queer folks mm -hmm. or am I just trying to access power mm -hmm. and profit from that and benefit from that and and and, and marinate in it mm -hmm. and do nothing for the you know for mm -hmm. the actual cause and so and also like in what framework right so like people who strive to be um in, in these like big on these big platforms it's kind of think about like what are these big platforms how are they built to begin with, yeah, right, and on whose backs were they built on, mm -hmm. and so how does our participation and engagement with these platforms actually doing or undo some of those things? Yeah, um, I'm thinking a lot about the representations um, that often go unheard of 
Um, so I'm thinking about some of our queer Asian elders that we have had the privilege to, 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 to meet um, through Sticky Rice was um, uh, Paul Wong's work, right? Mm -hmm. Or like Richard Fung's work as mm -hmm. well. And how they've pretty much set, um, have pioneered a whole new um, genre mm -hmm. of queer relations mm -hmm. and queer beings mm -hmm. in society. Um, in particular, a queer Asians. Mm. And everybody who's watching this needs to look them up. Yes. Richard Fung, Paul Wong. Um, I think a full conversation about them is going to be an hour, so we're just going <laughs> to pause there. But uh, yeah, I think I, I, I really like how our conversation is kind of gesturing about mis misrepresentation, is gesturing towards like what kind of power relations exist within those spaces, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so how do we engage in actual representation then? That is a loaded question. You take it on. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, as I said before, I do think engaging in actual representation requires us to make the platforms that are used to do representation mm -hmm. more accessible to a wider variety of people mm -hmm. and to also accept that representation can take many different forms. Mm -hmm. That it's not just one thing yeah. or one kind of stories. And the more we have stories and the more we have mediums on which mm. to tell those stories, the more accurate of a representation we are going to have. And also, I think another problem with representation currently is that it is used often as a kind of credentialism, as in like, Ooh. well, you know, I have this person into this movie or this TV show or this space and that is going to be my representation and that's kind of like a credit mm. that they put at the end of their thing. Yeah. But I think if you're going to have true representation, the cachet of like having a credit that is quote unquote representative needs to go away because I think that this is also kind of what's happening with a lot of social social justice movement is that it's almost become as if like being involved in some kind of social justice movement is like, like a credit or something <laughs> to brag about. And when that should absolutely not be the case. And yeah. I think that then if that is the incentive, it will end up getting a lot of people mm who are only there for like the byline or the, the oh, awards yeah. or the recognition to get into these things mm -hmm. while not really doing much for the actual cause. And I think that if we really want to solve representation problem, we have to just take this credentialism mm -hmm. aspect away mm -hmm. so that people aren't like rewarded with like individual gains, like more money or Mm. more things added to their CVs or mm -hmm. more awards just for doing representation. Mm -hmm. I think that really needs to be taken away. Yeah, I think, I mean, we love awards. We love yes. recognition. <laughs> we love badges. We love hashtags. But I think to, to just kind of ex extend on your point is that I think um, how the, where people are orienting themselves in, in, in relation to all of these movements is not one that allows for queer liberation. No. Or, or, or collective liberation yeah. and freedom. So unless we get to that point for, that part first, I don't think we need to talk about badges, accolades, mm -hmm. credits, and all that stuff. Um, and how dangerous that is, right? To think about how people use those opportunities that could, be, could have been way better um, utilized by someone else who has a different agenda, yeah. how those opportunities are then taken by folks who are just doing it for the sake of gaining something from it, yeah. Yeah. for personal profit, right? Yeah. Um, and that in turn uh, continues to oppress and marginalize um, people like them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think 
also like in those spaces of representation, like what you were talking about uh, in terms of like having more folks in it, is that some of these folks need to step down. Oh yeah. They need to yeah. get out, <laughs> yeah, retire, right? <laughs> like pack up your bags and leave because um, it is not by me coming in or just sitting at the end of the table eating breadcrumbs while you're feasting on a big meal that's gonna help me liberate mm -hmm. my people, right? So some of those people need to kind of like get out of there. Um, yeah. But that's my final thought on that. I, I think just to add on to, to, to that thought, I, I think that also um, the, the over focus mm -hmm. we have on representation often can be misguided yeah. because just having representation in the public sphere does not necessarily mean that the living conditions of the people that are being represented mm -hmm. in the public sphere are better. Yeah. And I think that it, it can, like having representation in the public sphere and raising awareness about you know, the living conditions and the lives of these people can lead to an improvement mm -hmm. of their living condition, but it's not always the case. Yeah. So I do think that uh, in a lot of cases, just like attending to like, you know, people's immediate needs and their mm -hmm. lives and their experiences and just trying to improve your day-to-day -day reality mm -hmm. is a lot more powerful than having representation in the public sphere, yeah. you know? And I think that like, for example, it's not going to do much if there's, you know, queer Asians on the screen in like big movies or big TV shows or like running for a political office if you have trans Asian women sex workers who are still like on mm -hmm. the street and barely making ends meet, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So and I- no, no protection. No protection, no exactly. Protection. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was gonna say something, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, right? I think even in, in terms of like talking about, found it, in, in terms of talking about representation, right? Mm -hmm. You were saying how, um, not you were saying, but the, the, where we were going with this was that we were critiquing how folks, some folks tend to utilize those opportunities to kind of take on, mm -hmm. you know, roles, tasks, responsibilities, titles in order to gain and profit personally. And maybe um, their intentions might be disguised under one that is like, I am someone who's representing my mm -hmm. community. I think how those positions are, or, or offers are being formulated to begin with comes from a place or a framework where representation doesn't come from our eyes. It comes from other people's eyes, yeah. right? So what does representation, representation look like in these people's eyes, yeah. which often ends up portraying Asians as this monolithic mm -hmm. kind of group, right? And so, and not to say that Asian folks are not struggling with understanding representation amongst ourselves because there is such a wide and huge diversity amongst the broader Asian bracket, but it's to think about how um, those particular spaces are problematic to begin with. Mm -hmm. And if our job or if our, um, I guess engagement and, and, and deliberate decisions to engage in those spaces to begin with is one that doesn't challenge it, yeah. right? But rather just kind of like, it opened up, this is great, and that ends up being the final goal. Yeah. That's gonna lead us to nowhere, mm. right? But I think how some people can begin to rethink is to think about how those, it's not to say you shouldn't take those jobs or that you shouldn't, um, uh, take up those offers, but it's to think about how that is not the end, yeah. right? That is merely the beginning oh, and yeah. yet a very rocky beginning, yeah. right? Because who wants to be a diversity hire? Nobody. Nobody, <laughs> right? Like if I come in and like, oh, Yo, you're the diversity hire. And they don't even need to say it, right? Because they could see it. Mm -hmm. And they'll give us the look. Well, I, at least I've felt that before where they've given me the look and I'm like, great, I know I'm the diversity hire mm. very much. Um, don't need you to tell me twice or make me feel terrible about it. Um, but even in those spaces, once you've entered them, you still have to work 10, 20, oh, yeah. 40 times harder. Um, not that you need to prove yourself, but just to kind of survive and stay afloat in that space, right? Um, because you end up being alone. Yeah. And you end up being the only person or that you seek solidarity through other 
other marginalized people mm -hmm. and, 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 and those kind of coalition building mm -hmm. um, to kind of uh, stay afloat. And so, all right, aspirations or Asian queer futurity, as I would like to call it. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts? <laughs> I mean, I, I do think the, the queer Asian futurities is something that is still uncertain mm -hmm. in being formed at the moment. And I think mm -hmm. it's a good thing that it is like that because oh, yeah. there are so many diverse Asian people from different cultures with different queer experiences and queer sexualities that if it's like undefined and uncertain in a way there is room for everyone and yeah. to everyone to kind of build together mm -hmm. what it might look like so that everyone is included mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but um yeah i don't know what do you think mm. um I think queer futurity um, from an Asian perspective is one that cannot be solely and merely Asian. Mm -hmm. I think a lot about how kind of going back to my thought earlier on liberation, collective liberation, collective freedom is one that includes other marginalized forms, mm -hmm. right? So how as queer Asians are we in relation with um, fellow Black queers and indigenous, mm -hmm. queer, indigenous queer people, uh, two-spirited people, et cetera, gender non-conforming, non-binary folks, how are we all together, yeah. right? And I think that is queer Asian futurity, is that it's one that is not isolated from other queer um, realms. Um, mm -hmm. um, and one that is in constant relation with them. Mm -hmm. um, but like you were saying, there's a lot to be done mm -hmm. before we get there, right? There's so much unlearning and unmaking and even understanding when it comes to our own um, experiences and struggles and conflicts and tensions uh, whether they are relational, whether they are with, with folks, with people, or structures, right? Yeah. Or, um, or that they are societal. And I think that a lot of people um, need to um, engage with, with that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and with each other, yeah. right? I think, um, I think a lot of us are also afraid to burden other folks. Um, I think that's a very uh, it's very cultural, Asian. It's very, yes. it's very Asian. I was just say I was just gonna say cultural, but yes, Asian. That's very Asian <laughs> to not to not want to overburden other folks, and yeah. so sometimes we tend to isolate ourselves and try to do it on our own. Mm -hmm. In which that is antithetical to queer relations, right? Mm -hmm. Because queer relations require relations. It requires people. It requires. Um, connections and solidarity mm -hmm. and coalition building. Um, so I think kind of undoing and un, un, um, unlearning that kind of impulse of self-isolation where staying in that closet, again, kind of taking that framework again, um, in which the closet only represents isolation mm. uh, and not generative possibilities, um, then that kind of self-quarantining, uh, not to be punny here with COVID, um, can be damaging and can be it, it harmful for, one, for someone, right? Um, and so then again, I am alluding to this idea of closet being a different type of framework um, mm. than that that we're so, than that of, you know, what we're used to hearing, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of like that because I I completely agree with what you say that liberation mm -hmm. for queer Asians will come also from liberation of all other people as well. That's right. And I, I do think that we queer Asians have to remember that fits into our model of relationships, like very relational, that we can't really be liberated or exist without all of these other communities, Ooh. you know? And 
that it's only by being in solidarity with mm. each other mm -hmm. that we can exist and mm -hmm. that we can be liberated yeah. together. And I think, I think that's something that um, should be pointed out more often because oh, yeah. I think that especially in the discourse of like identity politics where there's like many different labels <laughs> of like sexuality or gender or race, which are very useful and like can uh, be like very helpful for people, yeah. can also be divisive. And like, I have this label, mm. you have this other label, and they have this other label, you mm. know? Sub-communities. Sub-communities, exactly. <laughs> but we also have to remember, mm. yes, we have a lot of differences and a lot of diversity mm -hmm. among us, but we also have a lot of things in common. Right. And that we have to be in relation with each other mm -hmm. and work together mm -hmm. like but with these shared com commonalities and also Absolutely. like accept our differences and yeah. like let our differences rise yeah. as well Absolutely. you know and and yeah and i, I think I, I personally think that it's very compatible mm -hmm. with the asian model of just being so relationship oriented mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we could use that as a tool for liberation. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. And I, and just to kind of piggyback on what you were saying about mm -hmm. those labels and categories and identity politics, mm -hmm. is that how I envision um, liberation, let alone queer liberation and all that, but um, is one that would not require those labels, mm -hmm. right? Um, although they may be helpful now because mm -hmm. It allows us to situate, it allows us to um, interact with each other, it allows us to understand each other. But I think it's an understanding, a situating that, sit, that is placed or, or found within a structure that is, or, that is problematic, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't allow us to understand. So we use those tools to understand. So when we think, I, I, I want to kind of challenge this idea um, where queer liberation would then reflect a, f a, future, a future that doesn't require those, mm -hmm. um, those labels and categories and um, subdivisions of how queer you are or how queer you are not, right? Um, that one that can be um, unspoken of and just kind of like, let's go about our days, right? Like, mm -hmm. we don't need to talk about, be mm -hmm. about queerness because there's, everybody's queer everything is queer right so yeah. that we don't need to we don't need to define or to um to make people or make ourselves understand how different we are in relation to current society right? mm -hmm. so i think this utopia of of a future would be one that doesn't require any of that um constant like categorization of who we are yeah. Uh, in relation to others or in relation to the space. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a very good point because, I mean, the LGB, LGBTQIA plus, like, you know, umbrella now has, like, so many terms. It will underneath. keep growing. It will keep, it will keep growing, growing. Because I think now people are starting to understand mm -hmm. that sexuality and gender have so many nuances and that everybody experiences them differently and uh it's very it can mm. be very specific to like certain people or like a person themselves right so then as you were saying at some point maybe everybody is going to be queer because there is something in our gender identity or sexuality Welcome that to the is club. a bit right? <laughs> different <laughs> yeah. from others and right so right. so and i think that like this idea that you have to fit a certain box mm -hmm. or a certain label it's very colonial in the way oh. of like classifying people in like little categories yeah and i think that if we're going to get rid of that mm. and just be like well i accept that this person's sexuality and gender is just that way and that this other person's is that way and we just kind of see them for who they are we're not necessarily having to put the label on it to explain it or to mm -hmm. restrict it or to define it, mm -hmm. then that's freedom. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, these are colonial definitions, yeah. right? Like um, when we have def definitions, it de actually draws a line between, mm -hmm. you know, experiences, mm -hmm. right? And so 
then it also is juxtaposed with some sort of normative relation, which mm -hmm. is oftentimes, if not always, represented as heteronormative mm -hmm. relations. Um, so maybe, if I dare, uh, maybe queer futurity would be that heterosexuality is also queer at one point. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, there's such a thing as Don't like- Don't come at me for those who disagree. Heteroflexibility. Yeah. Like, right. You know, that's, I Absolutely. think that that's a thing now. <laughs> yeah. Because there's this constant desire to, to, to fit into that mold. But if, if that, if we abolish that, right, mm -hmm. then queer futures can actually mean that, you know, people who are attracted, who want to be in relation with um, um, the same sex, uh, sorry, opposing sex partners, and only that, right, mm -hmm. um, that can, one day be a queer relation. Yeah. Right? Totally. But we're not there yet. We're, we're not, not there yet. We're no. really <laughs> not there because homophobia is still real. So yes. um, that is just a dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can dream. We can, <laughs> we can dream. <laughs> dreaming hard. I think, I, I think, like, a, I think an ending, um, uh, just to end here about kind of to do a full circle around the, the topic of, of closet, right, is that, is that, to contest the idea of the normative discourse around the closet um, being this like unsafe space in that mm. you have to leave and um, exit in order to be free. Um, to challenge that is to rethink what does your closet look like from inside? Mm. And how is that closet allowing you to be safe? How is that closet allowing you to um, heal, to just be yourself, um, to tend to your wounds and to tend to your uh, needs. And also, who is to say that no one can also be invited into your closet? Yeah, exactly. Right? You can have guests in. Ah, absolutely. You know? People have got walk-in closets. So, yeah, exactly. Right? Like, people have, people have got space. Yeah. Clear up some space for others, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like I like that. I like mm, you communal you know, closets. Communal closets, like yeah. have a party in it. Yeah, like invite people. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So that would be my final thought. Yeah. 